Lyft is starting its own autonomous driving division. Find out how much Google, Apple, Facebook, and other tech companies are lobbying DC. And Lindsay Turntine is here to talk about Amazon and the FTC and so many other tech stories. I hope you'll stick around for Tech News Today. Coming right up. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1815, recorded Friday, July 21st, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world just using your smartphone. It's like caller ID, but for your house. Go to ring.com slash TNT and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we talk about technology with people who are passionate about technology. Jason Howell is still out. This is my guest, Lindsay Turrentine from CNET, editor-in-chief of CNET. And welcome back to the show, Lindsay. It's been a while. Thank you. It's been a while, and I'm really excited to be spending a Friday afternoon kicking off a weekend with you. I know often you appear on CBS This Morning, uh, which is more, um, how I, shall I say it? Uh, early in the morning. Yeah, that is more early in the morning. <laughs> um, and we don't have a green room and you're in your house. Which do you like better? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I think that I have to say that I like them equally. I okay. like all media appearances the same. <laughs> right, I know. Which do you like better, your son or your daughter? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to make you choose. Um, I love the work that you do at CNET. Um, I've gotten so much advice from you and everyone else there over the years. And so let's talk some technology. Let's do it. The Wall Street Journal reports that Lyft is forming its own driverless car development division. The company says it will develop its own hardware and software, but they won't be building their own cars, just the kits to make the cars self-driving. Lyft will hire hundreds of engineers for its new office called Level 5, which is the final level of autonomy where cars really drive themselves. Now, what do you think about Lyft's sort of late entry into this game? Well, I think this is interesting and maybe really smart. I think there's been, you know, obviously a ton of trailblazing about autonomous driving for a long time. Lyft has kind of sat back and said, "We're just going to work with partners. Uh, we're going to we're we're friendly with everybody, but we're going to we're going to go with these preferred partners to help it deliver this technology that we know we're eventually going to need." Now that that's been going on for a while, they've probably gotten a chance to see what is going to work for them, a company with very specific needs, because they're talking about um, a service-based business, as opposed to uh, something that is really going to be sold to an individual person. And they're probably finding the gaps, and then they can build an engineering team that will help address those gaps, as opposed to something like Uber, which has really been like, we're going to do this all on our own from the get-go, and now is really struggling. I mean, albeit for some other reasons and dealing with some big HR issues, but Lyft is probably finding a really good time to do some hiring in the autonomous um, engineering world. Yeah, I mean, it'd be very difficult for Lyft to make a bigger misstep at this point than to make them look not like the golden child compared to Uber. So yeah, that it just does seem like now is their time to strike and, and they have been, they have lot, they've made lots of deals uh, they have a you know deal with Newtonomy and General Motors, and they say they're very clear about the fact that this won't affect those deals. It's just aside from that. And yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's really exciting. I hate driving my own car. I'm really excited to have a robot driving my car for me. Are you are you going to miss driving eventually? I you know, actually, I love driving. The part of driving that I'm not going to miss is the part where I'm frantically trying to pick up a carpool or get from point A to point B and there's a traffic jam. Uh, I'll miss like country road driving, the you know, but I only really do that occasionally. And I will not miss the harried part of it. I won't miss the traffic jams. I won't miss, I mean, think about it. We could, we could completely like, get rid of traffic lights altogether. I won't miss that. I won't miss that either. Yeah, I, I, the thing that sounds amazing to me is the program that Waymo is doing in Phoenix, where if you got chosen as one of these families, if you signed up, they'll basically pick you up anywhere you want in the Phoenix area, uh, which is pretty big, like the Phoenix and surrounding areas, which is just amazing. Because if you think about, 
I know you're a mom too. So it's like to, you know, to band practice, to soccer practice, to school, to my friend's house, you know, and just the, the whole, like, am I going to my friend's house back and forth decision-making just to be able to have someone else do that. I'm happy to ride along with my kids and talk to them, but just to be like this the whole time, I won't miss that. Yeah. 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 I, I, there's so much time to be recovered here, especially for people who like us who live in big urban areas, anybody who lives, like you said, the Phoenix area or Atlanta, LA, the Bay area now in these places where increasingly we spend such a huge percentage of our hours in the car. If I can regain those hours in any way, I'm thrilled. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time to update your iPhone and your iPad, especially if you use Wi-Fi and who doesn't. The secret, the security update has been available since Wednesday for iOS and it's iOS 10.3.3. And uh, your writer at CNET says, if you haven't installed it, you really should. Without the update, hackers could theoretically access your device through the iPhone's Wi-Fi chipset while you're searching for a signal. The vulnerability affects all phones and tablets with these specific three types of broad Calm chips. So have you updated your devices yet, Lindsay? I have. I do not want this to happen to me. I mean, this is very severe vulnerability. And it's actually one that exists in lots of chipsets. Um, it's just that Google patched it for Android on July 5th. So the patch has been out. It's important for lots of people to update their phones regardless. I mean, I would just be safe and, and update regardless. Um, but this is all phones, iPhone 5 to iPhone 7. It's the fourth generation iPad and later and the iPod touch sixth generation and later, that's a lot of devices. And the thing is that hackers, were they able to exploit this particular vulnerability, they wouldn't need a password to take advantage of it. So it's really, there's no protection other than updating. Right. Like some iPhone seven and seven pluses have the Intel chipset in them, but you don't know unless you have the, looked at the, um, the, the little number on the back and, you know, you know a lot about yep. it. So yeah, no reason not to update, I would say. Um, and none of these chips are found in Mac. So that's not a problem if your Mac no, is searching not, for Wi-Fi. Yeah. But I, I do love the, the, you know, if you use Wi-Fi, you should <laughs> yeah. update. Yeah. Which means you. Right. If you don't use, yeah, if you don't <laughs> use Wi-Fi at all, like you're saving a lot of problems for yourself. Like your life is yeah. essentially easy. If you don't use Wi-Fi. You... So, but you're probably not watching this show. Yeah. Well, it, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. If you don't use the internet at all, then really security is, <laughs> you know, you don't even have to think about security at all. But again, you're probably not watching this show if you don't use the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Axios says Google, Apple, and Amazon have spent record amounts in lobbying this year. Just in the last three months, Google has spent $5.93 million, Apple $2.2 million, Amazon $3.21 million. Now, we should note that although a lot of this money is spent to combat some of the current president's policies, the companies have also spent a lot lobbying Republicans when it serves their interests. I thought this was really interesting, the, the breakdown that they did. Facebook spent a lot, too. They spent $2.38 million, but that is not their record. They always spend a lot. Uh, Google, Apple, and Amazon lobbied for high-skilled immigra immigration, which is, of course, in their interest. What do you think about the, all these companies lobbying D.C.? Well, I think, it, I think it's a reflection of how chaotic the D.C. environment feels right now. I think that because really nobody knows what's going to happen, there's so much uncertainty about the business environment, there's uncertainty about the administration, there's uncertainty about net neutrality. I think because there's so much uncertainty... I am guessing these companies feel like they have to protect themselves by getting as much opinion out there and as many people work in the system as possible. What surprised me a little bit, and I guess it makes sense given the size of Google and the size of Apple and the size of Amazon and the breadth of their businesses, but that Uber's spend was so small compared to, say, Amazon. Amazon, 3.2 million, Uber, 430,000. And it makes sense. Uber's a smaller company, but its market cap is so huge. And and what it's having to deal with from a regulatory standpoint seems gigantic. That surprised me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, the cynic in me says that they weren't, they didn't need regulations. They just rushed right through them. And uh, so many times they, you know, the the auto, the, the self-driving truck in Nevada, they didn't, you know, that there were regulations against that and they just did it anyway. So that's what the, the cynic in me, but I haven't done all of the research. I'm sure that there were some reg regulations that Uber did follow this year. 
Absolutely. <laughs> uh, when so- they prepare themselves for when they really do have to deal with regulations. Exactly. Like that. Yes. seems to think now. Yeah. Well, see, our one in the chat room says, why lobby by politicians direct from Amazon? I did not know that Amazon was selling politicians, but that... <laughs> think they sell everything. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> it sounds funny now, but like, I feel, I do honestly feel like in 10 years from now, there could be just like, oh, if you want to buy a politician, just, you know, order it from your Amazon Echo. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sci-fi story here. Yes. Right. it. Exactly. Anybody, anybody on Twitter, go write it. Yes. After the break, we'll talk Amazon Essential Phone and how to go to the International Space Station, even if you love gravity. But first, let's take a minute to thank Ring, the sponsor of this episode. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. Today, over a million people use the amazing Ring video doorbell to help protect their homes. You've heard us talk about it. It's the it's the unobtrusive video doorbell that you can look, uh, so when someone rings your doorbell, it rings on your phone, whether you're inside or out. And Ring knows that security begins at your front door, but it does not end there. That's why they're now extending that same level of security to the rest of your home with the Ring floodlight cam. It is again, a beautifully designed floodlight that has a camera inside and you can talk through the light, which is great. Just like Ring's video doorbell, floodlight cam is a motion activated camera and floodlight that connects to your phone. So if there's someone walking outside, a kid coming home late or a deer, or as I said yesterday, a zombie, you gotta watch out for zombies always. You can see through your light. With HD video and two-way audio, it lets you know the moment anyone or anything steps on your property. You can see and speak to visitors, whether they're welcome or not, even set off an alarm right from your phone. With Ring's floodlight cam, when things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. Whether you're home or away, the Ring floodlight cam lets you keep an eye on your home. Ring floodlight cam offers the ultimate in home security with high visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security in your hands. You can pan, you can zoom, get in real close to that zombie and see how dangerous he looks. Maybe he or she or it is not dangerous at all. It's named the Wall Street Journal's best of CES 2017. Monitor every corner of your property with a ring of security kit. All kits include a ring video doorbell and then your choice of either one, two or three floodlight cams. Connect your ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience monitoring and security. With ring, you are always home and you can now save up to $150 off a ring of security kit when you go to ring.com slash TNT. That's ring.com slash TNT. And of course we thank ring for their support of tech news today. So I recently bought an Echo Dot, even though I already have three dots and I have the original Amazon Echo and I have the Echo Show with a screen. I did not need it and I bought it because it was on sale and I happened to know that uh, it was half price. It was half the price that I paid for my original Echo, but I'm certain that I have also bought a lot of things in the past that appeared to be on sale, but were really the regular price with just a, hey, on sale. Now, one of your reporters says Amazon has done this often and the FTC is not happy about it. Tell us a little bit about this story. So Consumer Watchdog, uh, the, the organization, complained to the FTC that what Amazon was doing was listing reference prices in the days leading up to a sale announcing the sale, but that when the sale actually arrived, the prices were higher than the reference prices. So what they're, they're essentially saying false advertising, you're saying consumers are going to get one thing and they're actually getting another. Uh, I think that that's, it's interesting. Um, Amazon answers that the consumer watchdog study they say is flawed. It's based on assumptions and incomplete data. And, you know, it could be, I will say, and I have no idea if this is true or if it's not, but Amazon uses a lot of algorithms, and I'm sure that they're very, using some very uh, canny methods to try to figure out what a sale to you, Megan, is as opposed to a sale to me. And maybe they know, depending on where I live, I would pay slightly more for some embroidery thread than you would. And they're advertising one price to me and maybe one price to you. And, and, and who knows? It's possible that there's so much information here and there's so much math going into these decisions that uh, that a simple study is not going to accurately re- represent what it is that Amazon is doing. But I'm really glad that the FTC is looking into it because these prices change so much. 
they're so malleable that I think it's probably honestly even hard for Amazon to keep track of. Yeah. So, so, okay. I got that a little bit wrong. So what you're saying is that before, so before, let's say use the Echo Dot as an example, which when I originally purchased it was $50 and then I got it for $35. So what you're saying is like before they would make it $50 and then that day it would be third, it would be more than that? Or I'm, I'm confused about exactly what. They're saying that in the, so, so I'll read this exactly. It's a little bit confusing. Okay. So that, that, that what they're claiming is that on 46% of the products that they studied in this study, consumer watchdog studied, 46% of those products were listed higher during the sale, meaning they cost more during the actual sale than in the 90 days leading up to it. So making consumers think that they're getting a better deal than they actually are. Uh, so they're saying this thing is going on sale, here's the list price, and then when the sale arrives, they actually buy it for a little bit more. That's what Consumer Watchdog is saying. I got it. Yeah, I mean, but there's so many, like, it's really important to think about what you're saying too. Like, what is a high price for me? What is a high price for you or very different? I mean, that's what Amazon knows that there are people that have uh, a lot of money and no time. And then there's people that have no, that have little money and a lot of time. And they're, you know, they're, all of those algorithms are working into that. And then there's the people with a lot of time and a lot of money and, you know, just, just every, they, they really know. And they've, it's not just the prices themselves, it's how you order things, right? Because what it's worth it to me to just tell my um, voice assistant to order a paper towels so I don't have to think about it, but then I have no idea how much I'm paying for those paper towels. Absolutely. I mean, on the flip side, even if that's true and even if it's not technically unfair, I'm really glad that somebody's looking into it because it's a slippery slope. And when things get really complicated and people aren't paying attention, I think often the consumer ends up paying the price for convenience or ends up paying the price for that complexity because they're not able to figure out that maybe they're being treated unfairly because of past behavior. So I'm glad that somebody's looking into it. I think there's probably a lot more to discover here. Right, because I mean, when they came up, I mean, there was so many things about technology. When they came up with the price fixing laws and you know when they were looking at this originally there was no such thing as an algorithm that would know how much you would pay for something versus how much I would pay for something there was no such thing as a voice assistant that would let me pay for something you know so it it really had they have to re look at these in terms of the technology that they're using absolutely and and Amazon has to be by far the most sophisticated retailer in this way and they have so much information on all of us and how we behave and what we want frankly that that it is, it's just really important that somebody keeps an eye on it. And I'm not saying that Amazon is nefarious in any way. It's just that, you know, a profit's a profit. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 their sale to their, their purchase of Whole Foods is not all the way through. Like they, you know, they, they haven't bought them yet. They ha that hasn't been approved and that, that has to get approved by the FTC as well, right? Absolutely. And so they're probably going to, ho I hope what they do is really kind of take a hard look at how Amazon markets to different people. When we're talking about food, we're talking about something that has been really protected as um, an item that needs to be sold fairly and, and, you know, that isn't often isn't taxed. That is something that is an essential item for life. Uh, so I, I'm glad that we're looking closely at how Amazon prices different things. But it would be really surprising to me if Amazon didn't look at smart ways to price groceries based on market, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure grocery stores do this already. I bet you anything that uh, a gallon of milk where I live in Berkeley is different from a gallon of milk in Arizona, is different from a gallon of milk in Hawaii where it's hard to get the milk there. Um, but I think that that probably will get even more nuanced once Amazon gets its hands on smart pricing. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess we will see. Android founder Andy Rubin's new Essential phone is coming in a few weeks, according to an email sent to customers. The device, the letter claimed, is in carrier certification combined with a few major executives leaving the company. This doesn't look promising for many people, uh, but do you think a delay just means they're trying to get it right the first time instead of rushing it out the door, possibly having it explode on planes or something like that? Oh, well, I think that I think that a delay essentially means, wow, this is harder than we thought. I mean, it is, despite Andy Rubin's history of developing Android, that doesn't mean he's ever built a phone before. And, I, and I've heard from people who work in the hardware world or who have worked in the hardware world that building hardware is really, really um, hard. <laughs> because... Essentially. You can't, you can't essentially. <laughs> so sorry. I was called Dottie earlier when you were talking about the dot, but then I just didn't. <laughs> I, you know, I think that building, you, you cannot fudge hardware. 
what you have in your hand is what you get. And, and from everybody I've ever met who's developed hardware, it's always harder than you think it's going to be. So I think it just means that they hit a couple of stumbling blocks. They are figuring out the, the concepts of supply chain. They're learning the realities of supply chain and trying to get many different makers of many different parts working in the same timeline against a deadline. I think that's really tough. Um, I, I'm, you know, Andy Rubin seemed to communicate very clearly about it, but I am also not really bullish about this phone, not because I think they're going to do a bad job with it, just because I think that people are pretty comfortable with the handsets they currently own. I think that that market is pretty saturated. It's not actually getting broader. It's getting narrower. People are buying sort of, there's less diversity in handsets right now or interest in that diversity. So I think that there's a really steep hill to climb for the essential phone team. Well, Patrick, who's running our prompter and likes to write on index cards, uh, has some thoughts as well on uh, <laughs> this. Uh, if you're listening, who knew that making a phone uh, would be so complicated? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I mean, I, I like the idea. I, I don't like the idea that we're in this duopoly of phones. I, I would like more phones, but it's true that I'm completely fine with, with my iPhone. What do you think of the fact that Sprint is their uh, carrier exclusive. I mean, I know you can get an unlocked one and everything, but like that seemed like to really be a weird choice for to a lot of people. I am personally, I am a Sprint user. I uh, get mocked for that, but I'm proud. Um, and you know, what do you think about the fact that, that Sprint was their carrier of choice? Oh, gosh, I am. I honestly was scratching my head. Um, that and not, it, that is just enough to, to keep me uh, from doing it simply because of coverage in my area, right? When it comes right down to it, people are going to buy phones that will work where they live. And and Sprint is, has not been so great for me. That's, I mean, it, I, I just, the only thing I can think of is that they got a great deal. Yeah. They got somebody who was eager to work with them. They got way more partnership, probably because Sprint is an underdog and maybe a team of people who are really happy to make things work for them. I hope they did. Well, I can't remember if this was the CNET article I read this or, or somewhere else, but they brought up the Palm Pre, which was, uh, I was super excited about the Palm Pre when it came out. And I, I don't, I think I'm getting the dates wrong, but I think it was post iPhone and you couldn't get the iPhone on Sprint for a really long time. And so this was the first like exciting phone and it did not do so well. So that was pointed out in, in that, you know, if anyone thinks about the last big carrier exclusive that Sprint had, the Palm Pre, this doesn't make the essential phone look that good either. Sure, it doesn't. I mean, the Palm Pre probably failed for reasons that had less to do with Sprint, I think, than, uh, than just the market having kind of moved on by the time the Palm Pre came out. And just sort of an interest in a different set of, of features, but but uh, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't bode particularly well. And and you know, I actually think that if the essential phone is successful, it's going to be because early adopters get excited about it and buy the unlocked versions and and fool around with it and find interesting things that they can do with it. And I don't think it's going to be because of Sprint. Well, Lindsay, it was great to talk to you. I know you are busy. Lindsay Turnstein is the editor-in-chief at CNET, uh, managing all the great writing and video and all the things that go up there. And she is L. Turrentine uh, on Twitter. Is there anything else that we should know about or any place else where we can find you? Uh, well, all of my peers on the CNET news side are really working hard right now on a summer road trip series that's very interesting. So I encourage you to go check it out. Oh, and yes. also all over Comic-Con. So if that's your jam... Um, and I'm really into Twin Peaks. There's there's a bunch of cool reporting happening on Twin Peaks. There's a Twin Peaks panel this afternoon. Go read that stuff. Yeah, you, you did send me one of Joan Salzman's uh, articles on VR, which uh, was fascinating. Um, definitely check check that out. That's at the top of CNET. Um, I, I couldn't fit it in today, but um, it was a, is a great read if you are uh, interested in, how, in VR and our brains. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. All right, Lindsay, take care. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, Megan, have a good weekend. All right, I got some feedback. Matt, uh, speaking of Amazon, he wrote about a story earlier this week about the Amazon treasure truck. That was the truck that would go around and, and you could buy things off the back of it and sometimes it gave you free candy. And he says, at what point should we as consumers be concerned that Amazon is getting too big. Because of Amazon, I have to drive six miles from home so I can buy a physical book. Because of Amazon, my local office depot is a veritable ghost town, town every time I go in. Because of Amazon, most store clerks I encounter could care less about their jobs because they know they'll eventually be fired when their employer wants cheaper labor. Because of Amazon, we have a 
be, we have become a throw it away society where people would rather buy a replacement than fix what they already have. And lastly, because of Amazon, we have become a nation of got to have it now, i.e. instant gratification. My, my answer, Matt, is uh, when should we be worried? Uh, now, probably <laughs> we should be worried. But I don't think that we can blame only Amazon for all of that. I think especially the got to have it now came before Amazon. And I think uh, a lot of that also comes with just social media and the Internet and everything. Everything is so fast these days. But I get... I, uh, I get what you mean in the, but I also, whenever I think about that, I think that the office de depot knocked the little tiny stationary store that was owned by mom and pop out of the neighborhood too. So part of it is just evolution, but thank you, uh, Matthew Howell for always uh, having such thoughtful emails that you send us. And TNT's fan of the day is Stephen Perry, who says, this is how I watch TNT while hurtling through the air at 32,000 feet enjoying Georgia Dow and Megan Maroney. I look like I'm taking a little nap while Georgia's talking, but I'm, I'm not. My eyes were just closed. Um, but I love that uh, that people are watching us in all kinds of places. Please, uh, no matter how weird or banal the place you watch us is, we like to see it. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. And finally, tonight, if you have ever wanted to live on the International Space Station, but you like the comforts of home and gravity, you're in luck. Today, Google announced that you can now check out the ISS through Google Street View. All you have to do is go, go, go to google.com slash street view. Right now, the link is at the top of the page. Uh, it is pretty amazing. There's also a video that you can uh, watch that I, I watched today about how they did it. They have a model of the ISS. And so they kind of planned it out where they were going to take the pictures. And then the astronauts that are there took all the photos. And it's just amazing where we can go these days. So spend a little time with that. And you will be reminded about how small we really are. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leaving us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW or come see us tickets at, at twit.tv to get tickets. We are really thankful for our guests that we have. <laughs> well, you can find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV, and you can subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. Thank you to our technical director, Kevin, who I'm always trying to keep on his toes. Thank you to Patrick for helping out in the studio and his tech, tech slash uh, political comments that you can only see the politics if you're watching the show. Uh, Kevin, thank you also for editing the show, if you are. I don't know if you are, but thank you. And thanks. <laughs> he says, sure. Thanks to Kevin for taking out the trash. Thanks to Kevin for washing up the desk and cleaning up the kitchen and whatever else they're going to make you do. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>